On this episode of Inside KU, KU paleontologists uncover new facts in a long debate about the Tyrannosaurus Rex. There are a lot of changes at KU. The chancellor gives us her thoughts in a one-on-one -on -one interview. And graduate students at the University of Kansas are working to uncover new ways to more effectively treat cancer. All that and more on this edition of Inside KU. Hi, I'm Jeannie Hodes. When someone says KU, most people think of historic Allen Field House. But there is so much more to the University of Kansas. Pay heed. For the next 30 minutes, we'll take you inside KU. This is one of the rooms in Murphy Hall where KU's Wind Ensemble rehearses. It's a group of about 70 students selected from the finest musicians at the university. Last spring, these students had an experience they will never forget, traveling from right here in Lawrence to Carnegie Hall in New York City, where they performed the world premiere of a symphony written especially for them. We arrived in New York City that evening. A lot of the students checked in and out on the town. Apparently it is a city that never sleeps. Monday we rehearsed um, all morning at the Domena Center downtown. It's a symphony about the events of 9-11 and the days and years that followed and a reflection looking back at the event and how it shaped us in today's political climate. I don't really want people to come away from the concert talking about what a great band you are. I have only interest in them talking about that piece, that music, what it did for them, where it took them. It's all about the music tomorrow. Be great because the music needs us to be great. Monday afternoon, we were at the 9-11 Memorial. They arranged a tour for us. It was a very cold, blustery, rainy day, miserable. It was perfect. You can't get any closer than ground zero. It makes it much more real to the ensemble. Tuesday was checking out of the hotel and a sound check at Carnegie and dinner together and the concert. It went very quickly here at the end. For us as an ensemble, the last couple of weeks has really gone beyond the sort of normal, oh, let's make sure this is in tune and play together there, but rather going right to the message of the music. When you have the technique mastered and you're just trying to make the music now, that's when we can be at our highest level. I knew along the way that they had prepared well. Everyone knew what they needed to do for the concert, and they did it. That was life changing, for sure. That was crazy. We had a, a wonderful crowd, a lot of friends and family in the audience, standing ovation, which is it's great to get a standing ovation after a concert, but in Carnegie Hall, that was incredible. It was awesome. It was a dream come true. I think every young aspiring musician hopes that they can play in Carnegie Hall someday, and so it's, it's awesome to finally realize that dream. We felt really prepared, and so there weren't many nerves going into it, and I think we felt really good coming out of it. To come to where, the place that it was written about just makes it that much more meaningful, and I think it means more to the audience, too. There were so many emotions. Uh, the woman who sat next to me actually grabbed my hand and we both felt the towers coming down. I would have never thought at 9-11 when it happened that one day my daughter was going to be on the stage making people remember what happened that day. If you'd like to see a wind ensemble performance or a performance by any of the other talented music students here at KU, there's a schedule of events listed on their website, music.ku.edu. KU's chancellor is the CEO of the university, overseeing five campuses as well as educational centers and research sites throughout the state. It's a big job that Dr. Bernadette Gray-Little has had since 2009 and she has some big changes in store. In terms of health, in terms of stature, in terms of economics, 
it's a huge benefit for the university and for the region. We'll talk to the chancellor a little later, but first we'll discover what a wayward tooth from a T-Rex revealed to KU paleontologists. The Tyrannosaurus rex is probably the most well-known dinosaur, but what you may not know is that it has also been at the center of a huge debate among paleontologists for decades. Well, a KU researcher has now found fossil evidence to settle that debate once and for all. My name is David Burnham. I'm in charge of field collections of dinosaurs and their preparation at the University of Kansas. I was involved with Tyrannosaurus rex almost from the very beginning of my career. T-Rex has been debated by scientists for about 100 years. We have physical evidence that dinosaur bones are being eaten, and we know they've been eaten by T-Rex because we can see the tooth marks on them. On the other hand, we don't know if they were eaten when they were alive or dead. And as a scientist, we require physical evidence. We need proof. We had a graduate student, Robert De Palma, doing his research in South Dakota, Hell Creek Formation, where, you know, very famous for dinosaur discoveries. He was cleaning fossils up and uh, right away he knew that this was abnormal. We're looking at two fused tailbones to a duck-billed dinosaur. And the reason the bones are fused is because this is sick bone growth. All this rumply stuff, this is bone that was infected. We became interested in this because, you know, fossils tell stories and when you get a sick fossil, it may tell an interesting story. So we cleaned this up and we saw um, a circular cross section right here and realized it was a tooth. And the tooth had broken off and infected the animal. The animal obviously got away because the bone grew around the tooth, right? So then we had this idea, well, if we can identify the tooth, we know who bit the dinosaur, and boy, wouldn't it be cool if it was a T-Rex, because we could finally show that once and for all, we have the physical evidence that it was a predator. We brought it to the hospital to get CT scanned. And once we had the CT scan, we could see there was an entire tooth in there. This is the tooth crown that was extracted uh, out of the uh, hadrosaur, and you can see that it still has the serrations that's the cutting edge, and there's one on the front and one on the back, and those serrations are like a steak knife. And you can count the serrations per millimeter, define their shape, and they're like fingerprints. They can tell you what species of dinosaur this tooth belonged to. We were able to determine that it was a Tyrannosaurus rex based on certain bits of morphology that are unique to that species. And this is what a complete T-Rex tooth would look like, just for comparison. See, just the tip broke off in the tail. Finding a T-Rex tooth embedded in the tail of a duck-billed dinosaur that got away and escaped the attack, and we know that because the bone healed around the tooth, settles it, settles that debate. You've got T-Rex, hands down, predator. Just like any 11-year-old will tell you, what did T-Rex eat? Anything I wanted. Right. right? right. <laughs> so, here at KU, we've got one of the best programs in the world. We strive to, to be the best in, in the field, and we have been for quite a few years. If you want to check out more dinosaur fossils, there are many on display here, along with lots of other exhibits at KU's Natural History Museum on campus. Check out their website for hours and tours. Coming up, we'll take you to where cutting-edge medicinal research is finding a more effective prostate cancer treatment. But first, the Chancellor shares her thoughts about changes at the University of Kansas. This is Inside KU with reporter Jeannie Hodes. I'm here with KU's Chancellor, Dr. Bernadette Gray-Little. Thanks so much for joining us. I first wanted to talk with you a little bit about what's happening around campus. Starting in 2016, there's going to be new admission standards for KU. Can you tell me a little bit about those standards and if you expect them to affect your recent trend of an increasing freshman enrollment? Mm -hmm. Let me say first that the reason that we looked at uh, admission standards had to do with our interest in having a higher percentage of our students be successful and leave KU with a KU degree. 
And so we've looked at our, the students that have been admitted and who have been successful in the past and tried to fashion uh, a set of admission standards that would allow us to get students to have a good chance of being successful. And there are two parts of the, the admission process. Uh, right now, students who have a 21 ACT are automatically admitted into any university in Kansas. And what the change will be is that starting in 2016, for automatic admission, students will have to have higher credentials than that. For students who don't meet that higher bar, then individual decisions will be made about their applications. So that students who don't have that uh, level of credential may in fact be admitted if on review their application seems to suggest that they can be successful. And how does it affect enrollment? We hope not very much. In addition to looking at uh, changing the admission standards, we are enhancing our recruitment efforts and trying to make sure that we get more applicants both from the state and beyond the state so that we can keep our enrollment up. I understand that KU also has a new general education curriculum for freshmen starting this year. Yes. Why was that change made? That's a very good question. And I, and I say it's a very good question because it's a huge amount of work for a university. But our general education curriculum had not been changed in a thorough way for at least 25 years. Universities usually don't do it more than every 20 years because it's a huge amount of work. But we thought it was time to review the things that we require and this gave us a chance to see that the requirements fit with what students need to know and also that um, we have a core curriculum that is in fact required of all students. So in this revision we have a core that all students who enter as first year students will take and we have asked the question, what is it that we think is so important that every student who comes here needs to know or be able to do? And that's how we've structured the core curriculum. So given these changes, what would you say to a high school student out there who might be thinking about coming to Kansas? I would say this is the time and this is the place. That uh, if you've talked to our students, you know the students really love the, the setting, the place. There are students here who are upper class students who wish they were having the new core right, so curriculum. I, I and some it. of them have wanted to see if they could go back <laughs> so <that> they could <laughs> get the core curriculum, which we're not allowing. But uh, I think the students uh, really like it and it gives them more flexibility because the core requirements are fewer in number than the old requirements. So they have more flexibility for elective courses and double majoring and uh, other special opportunities like that without increasing the time to degree. We want our students, uh, to the extent possible, to come and get a KU degree in four years. Right after this break, the Chancellor will address how recent state budget cuts will affect KU. You're watching Inside KU with reporter Jeannie Hodes. We'll pick up my interview with Dr. Gray Little as she discusses hurdles and opportunities at KU. Now, as you're trying to make all these changes mm -hmm. for the better, the state legislature just recently passed $13.5 million in budget cuts yes. for KU. So how is that impacting the university? Well, that does have an important effect at the university, and it, it affects different parts of the university uh, differently. For us here on the Lawrence campus, the primary effect is in our ability to hire faculty at the rate that we had planned to hire faculty. So is primarily going to result in a reduction in the rate at which we can hire new faculty members. And we've been very much looking forward to that to enhance our programs. At the Medical Center, it uh, means a reduction of students in some programs. Uh, the largest number probably that uh, reduction in students is in nursing, but there will also be some uh, reduction in the uh, medical students, especially students in the combined MD-PhD program. And uh, then some other outreach programs that we have from the medical center have also been uh, reduced or eliminated as a result. So it will mean that we're either a not able to do some of the things that we used to do or it might take us longer to do some things that we need to do. Is there any way to restore those cuts? Let's hope so. Uh, there has been discussion uh, and certainly the governor has talked about uh, working with the legislature to restore that funding, but it's, now I have no idea how likely that would be. 
talking about the medical center, that leads into my next question. Um, apparently, a half, almost half of the doctors in Kansas trained at KU, yes. yet we are experiencing a shortage of doctors in the state. What is KU trying to do about that? Well, we'd like to increase the number. And there is a plan to how we would recruit, uh, increase the number and what would be the level of increase. One of the components in that is that we need a new medical education building. The building that we have is old, it's out of date for the kind of instruction that medical students get these days. And so we have wanted to, very much wanted to have a new facility and we've had a request in for funding from the state uh, to do that. But that would allow us to make a, a significant increase in the number of medical students and medical graduates here in Kansas. And the KU Cancer Center just recently in 2012 got the National Cancer Institute designation. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the center and going forward? What's next for the Cancer Center? You may know uh, that it was at least a decade in preparation. A lot of attention focused on it just in the few years before, but it has been worked on and thought about for at least a decade. It is uh, it's a major achievement for a medical school to get that uh, designation. And it means that, um, well, it gives us some bragging rights. But in addition to that, it means that there would be better, more modern treatments available for patients in this region who could stay here and get the kind of treatments that they would not uh, otherwise be able to get. So it is a benefit in terms of the health of the population. It's a benefit in terms of our stature. It is an economic benefit because of the programs associated with our cancer center create jobs and create money for the region. So in terms of health, in terms of stature, in terms of economics, it's a huge benefit for the university and for the region. What are some other research programs going on at KU that might impact our state that some people may not be aware of? We have a faculty member in engineering who is interested in using cellulosic fiber from plants, that is a non-edible part of plants, to create chemicals that can replace the non-fuel uses of oil, like soap, detergents, and so on. And the process that he works on is one that changes those materials into the chemical that can then replace oil in these everyday products. And it's very exciting, especially for Kansas, because what we have, we have a lot of grains that we grow, and we have a lot of byproducts from those grains that could be used as the resource to, to make that chemical. So that's a, an exciting kind of research. It's great research, great economically, and it's so right for Kansas that it's a very exciting opportunity. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to see what happens next for KU. Thank you. There are certain questions that need to be answered in order to progress cancer therapy, and so I think that, you know, it's, it's important that we're addressing them. Stay tuned to learn how KU students are working on a better cancer treatment, one atom at a time. KU's West Campus houses labs like this one, focusing on cutting-edge medicinal research. It's here where a team of KU students are working on a more effective treatment for prostate cancer, the second leading cause of cancer deaths in American men. I love doing this research. It's at the very front of the drug discovery process, but it's basic science like this that is exciting. When KU graduate researcher Charlie Fail says basic science, he doesn't mean easy. He means at the root of life. He and fellow KU graduate student Elise Petronak are studying how to make a more effective treatment for prostate cancer at the atomic level. There are certain questions that need to be answered in order to progress cancer therapy, and so I think that, you know, it's, it's important that we're addressing them. The drug they are focused on Proving is called abiraterone. It's available for some patients with metastatic prostate cancer, meaning the cancer has spread to other parts of the body. So this is the spine and here's the metastasis right there. Dr. Jeff Holzberlein has several patients using abiraterone. He says it has been very helpful in slowing the progression of their cancer, but it also can have side effects like high blood pressure and liver problems. Holzberlein says some of his patients have to go on an additional steroid medication to manage those side effects, something he'd like to avoid. The last thing we want to do is be extending their life, but make them a professional patient where they're spending all their time at the hospital getting blood and other things checked. That's where Fail and Petronac come in. They hope to streamline the drug, 
to only stop the hormone production which fuels the cancer and leave other hormone production that causes side effects alone. But that is much easier said than done. There is no drug that is without side effects. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's definitely difficult to make a drug that's specific for shutting down one system. The KU professors overseeing Fail and Petronac's work agree this kind of biochemical work is one important direction cancer research is heading. I think there's a lot of emphasis on looking at things at the molecular level, being able to understand at the very most basic levels. While it it's maybe doesn't get a lot of fanfare in the press and those kinds of things, um, it's absolutely integral to being able to take those next steps. They can actually look at it atom by atom and understand really not only how it is built, but how it functions. And whether they'll actually turn into a new drug, time will tell. But we're confident that one way or another, they're certainly going to help us in our understanding of cancer, and that's going to bring us a step forward to new cures. Exciting progress for both researchers and doctors, hoping to prolong and save lives. I think where we're really heading in prostate cancer uh, is probably never a, a fact that we're going to have a curable cancer, but that we have a very treatable cancer. And so prostate cancer becomes a disease like diabetes or hypertension in that you have to take medications to manage that disease. As long as you're managing it, you don't actually die of the disease. And so these drugs are a step towards that. It is practical, hands-on work that will eventually lead to life-changing developments. Whether it's medicine, dinosaurs, or music, the University of Kansas always has bold aspirations to create new experiences and make new discoveries. It's our goal to highlight as many of these as possible. I'm Jeannie Hodes, and I hope you've enjoyed this journey inside KU. This is a production of Kansas City's Time Warner Cable Sports Channel.